Okay, First Samuel chapter 3, First Samuel chapter 3, and uh, I'd like to read um, the first 14 verses, although uh, we may get further than that, but uh, at least for the reading purposes, and uh, the, the title this morning is The Call of Samuel, uh, His Call to Prophetic Ministry, and uh, kind of a, a subtitle that might help us too is From Darkness to Dawn, uh, and uh, we will understand that as we go further in our study, but let's just read from verse one. It says this, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again. Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. The Lord called Samuel again, the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak. For thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'll do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever. For the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli, that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice, nor offering forever. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us. And uh, I said that our theme is the, the call of Samuel. And uh, I want to just kind of give you the outline before we begin, just uh, because sometimes in the midst of doing it, I'll forget the outline, and uh, I think it's just helpful. And so in the first 10 verses, we, we have Samuel learning to hear the voice of God. He wasn't used to that, and uh, he didn't yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. So he's learning to hear the voice of the Lord. Very important for any prophet to know that it's the Lord that's speaking and not someone else, right? So he, he learns to hear the voice of the Lord. And then verses 15, uh, sorry, verse 11 through 14, Samuel learns to appreciate the holiness of God, and particularly concerning uh, God's dis disdain at the sins of the house of Eli. And so Samuel learns to appreciate the holiness of God. And again, very important for anybody uh, who would be a spokesman for God to understand something of the holiness of God. And then verses 15 through 18, Samuel learns to communicate the message of God. Uh, he has to deliver that message that he received from the Lord. And so he learns to do that. And then verses 19 through 21, Samuel learns to trust the word of God. So that's kind of our outline, our theme, but we want to set the scene. And the introduction really sees Israel in darkness. And uh, one commentator puts it this way. He says, in the first three verses, a picture of Israel's moral condition. 
night reigned. The lamp of God was going out in the tabernacle. The high priest's eyes were grown dim, so he couldn't clearly see. And both he and Samuel were asleep. And so it's a pretty dark scene. And yet God is about to work. And I think, again, it's just good to be encouraged in this fact that so often when things are really dark, it's a perfect opportunity for God to begin to work. And you see that so often in revival, uh, both in scripture and in history, that often it comes at a very dark time. Uh, Josiah, the reign of Josiah would be a perfect example. Manasseh, wicked king. Uh, Ammon, his son, a wicked king. And then here's this eight-year-old boy and the whole scene's about to change. And so we see the very same scene here uh, there'd been such failure, as we learned last time, there was failure of priestly ministry. Uh, we learned that in chapter 2 from verses 12 through 17, where uh, these sons of Eli were uh, basically uh, feeding uh, off the altar, but not what had been a, a given to them, but uh, taking what didn't belong to them. And so the priestly ministry had failed. Priestly purity had failed. Uh, these were supposed to be a holy priesthood. And uh, we saw in chapter 2, verse 22, uh, how his uh, sons of Eli uh, lay with women at the door of the tabernacle. And then a failure of priestly authority in verse 29 where, uh, of chapter 2, where Samuel uh, should have uh, rebuked his sons and been loyal to God, and he didn't. And so the authority of the priesthood had broken down. And so the scene is bleak. But God, and here's a very important principle, never will nor ever has left himself without a witness. And no matter how dark it is, there's always a witness for God. Uh, darkest days of Israel's history, the dark ages when Ahab and Jezebel were reigning, God didn't leave himself without a witness. There was Elijah, and he thought at times he was the only one, but there were 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. And so it's good to know, no matter how dark it is, that there's still a remnant and there's still light. And so here, uh, dark as it is, God has still got a witness. And it's a, it's a very precarious witness, just a young lad. And yet Samuel, in, the, in these very difficult circumstances, is going to develop into a mighty man of God. And again, I, I said it last time. I want to say it again because it's really important for all of us to grasp this that we cannot use circumstances for an excuse for our own failure to follow the Lord. If, if Samuel was looking for excuses to not follow God, he had every excuse in the book. You know, the priesthood's corrupt, the, the whole place is bad, everybody, everything's dark, and so woe is me, I live in difficult times, I'm just going to roll over and just uh, give up. No, no, no. It, uh, and again, we just need to see that no matter how dark it is, God's word is still true. God's power is still real and God is still able to work and even using the weakest vessels. And so we just need to be reminded. So we said verses one through 10, Samuel learning to hear the voice of the Lord. And it, it really begins in, in verse one with Israel and the voice of God. So it says in verse one, the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. I suppose we should begin with how old was he? Well, this word child, uh, Josephus says Samuel was 12. Not sure where he gets that from, but he's quite adamant that Samuel was 12. But uh, I suspect he might have been a bit older than that. And my reason for that is the very same uh, word that's used here in Hebrew for child is used in 1 Samuel 17. If you want to just turn there for a second, 1 Samuel 17 and verse 33, where David has volunteered to fight Goliath. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And so it's the same word in the Hebrew. And so it would imply that he could have been older, teenager, probably 15, maybe, I don't know, can't be dogmatic, but we do know he wasn't full grown. He's still, uh, but in, remember, we got to remember in Jewish uh, mindset, uh, when you have your bar mitzvah, 
which uh, 12, 13, you become a man and a full son of the law. Uh, it's only in our wimpy culture that you're not considered fit for anything until you're 25 years of age. Uh, but in, in pre prior history, uh, when you were 12, you were considered passing from childhood to manhood and expected to man up. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, adolescence is an invention of psychology and is not, has no bearing in scripture whatsoever. And uh, in, in past history, uh, in, uh, in Christendom, uh, when you were 12, you uh, were considered, uh, you went through your confirmation and you were considered to act as an adult. And uh, oftentimes men would go to sea and uh, at 12, uh, you know, they'd be fit to go to sea. And by the time they're 15, 16, some of them were captains of ships. And uh, sadly in our age, um, you know, we have, we have kind of, well, we have adults that are still behaving like children, never mind 25 year olds, but uh, even some 50 year olds and so on and so forth. So, uh, but he, so anyway, uh, the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And it tells us this, that the word of the Lord was precious in those days, and there was no open vision. Now, of course, the word of God is always precious, but uh, the idea of precious here is you know, what makes uh, precious metals precious is their scarcity, their rarity. So that's why gold's always got a value to it because there's not a lot of it to go around and you can't really make it, right? So, and so the idea is this, that the word of God was rare in those days. Yeah, there was no open vision. And so uh, th there's no public revelation of God's will concerning his people. No open manifestation of his mind, either by dreams or by a prophet or by Urim or Thummim. Uh, it, it was, the idea was this, the heavens were silent. You often hear the heavens are like brass, right? They're kind of, there's, no, there's no, nothing coming from heaven. Well, that's exactly what's going on at this time. And so we might ask the question, why was God's word so rare? Why was he so silent? Why was he not speaking to Israel? Why use the term uh, like rarity or preciousness? Uh, well, it was because Israel was under his displeasure because of the corruption of the priesthood, but not just the priesthood, the whole nation. Look at 1 Samuel 7, 1 Samuel 7, verses 3 and 4. It says, Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, if you do return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts to the Lord and serve him only, and he'll deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And the children of Israel put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. And so we can tell that it wasn't just the priesthood, but as priests, so like people, in other words, the condition of the nation was pretty bleak. Yes, there was a remnant. Uh, there was still, uh, remember Hannah, we've already met some of the remnant of that day. Elkanah still came to the house of God. But generally the scene, uh, the people of God had turned their back on him. And so Jehovah was withdrawing the light of his word and allowing Israel to wander in darkness that she evidently preferred. She preferred the idols than God. And so God takes men seriously. If that's what you want, you can have it. And uh, one of the means of God's judgment is giving man what he wants. God gave them over. Romans chapter one, if that's what you want, you can have it, right? And so, and one of the, the manifestations of divine judgment is usually silence from heaven. I want to give you some examples just quickly. Uh, the book of Amos, it just so happens in my daily readings. I'm in Amos at the moment. And Amos chapter 8 and verse 11 and 12 says this, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north, even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And again, it's always a manifestation of divine judgment. 
want to just look at another portion, please, in Psalm 74. Psalm 74, which is a pretty bleak chapter, uh, this psalm, describes the destruction of the temple. Uh, and uh, we'll break in at Psalm 74, verse 3. It says, lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their ensigns for signs. A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees. But now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire into the sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. And then notice verse 9. So if, if destroying the temple of God wasn't bad enough, notice verse 9. We see not our signs. There's no more any prophet. Neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. And so mixed with the desolation of the, the temple, the voice of the prophet seemed to have gone silent. And so what we can see is that God uh, had shown his displeasure to the uh, nation at this time by withholding his voice. Now, we need to just recognize in our day, um, his voice is everywhere. His voice is in creation. Right. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament. You know, it, it, I mean, just the word of God is clear. God is speaking. Uh, he's speaking in conscience. Man's conscience speaks to, to him of, of God. And then the word of God is freely available in most places in the world. There's still a few places, uh, primitive tribes that don't have the Bible in their own language. But uh, amazing. The word of God is available. Uh, I just marvel in the U.S., that you can go to Walmart and you can buy a copy of the word of God easily, right? Just in Walmart, right? You go shopping, it's right there. Uh, airports, uh, it's amazing how many airports have got uh, Bibles for sale. It's just amazing. So, so it's not that God's voice is, and then of course, God has spoken lastly in his son, right? And of course, the greatest revelation. And so it's not that God isn't speaking today. The problem is not with God speaking. Today, the problem is on the receiving end, right? It's, it's people, are people listening? And uh, that's, that's where the problem comes. Isaiah, the prophet, mentions in Isaiah 6, after this great revelation of the holiness of God uh, to the prophet, as he is allowed to see, uh, uh, get a glimpse actually of Christ. John 12 would tell us that it was the Lord Jesus, a, a manifestation of Christ that he saw. But verse 9 and 10 says this. He said, go and tell this people, hear you indeed, but understand not. See you indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. And so sometimes the problem is not that God isn't speaking, that people's ears are heavy and they're not able to hear. And I find um, one of the great messages to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, the refrain through all of those messages goes like this. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And so the, the question isn't, is God speaking today? God is speaking today. The question is, are we listening? And are we, do we have ears that are listening for his voice and responsive, hearing with the idea of obedience? And that's the problem in the church today is we're not, it's not that we're not hearing. We're not hearing with ears that are tuned to obey the word of God. And that's where the problem is. That's where the deficiency is. And disobedience robs us of the voice of God. And uh, the heavens were silent. And yet into this bleak scene of darkness and silence from heaven, it tells us uh, that from verse 2 onwards, we're going to see God beginning to speak in the silence of God. It says, and it came to pass at that time 
when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he couldn't see. And of course that raises lots of questions. Uh, his dimness of vision was very literal, but it was also perhaps figurative as well of a lack of moral discernment that we've already evidenced that he didn't understand the holiness of God sufficiently to put his sons out of the ministry. But then one wonders too, uh, Leviticus 21 verse 18, that tells us that the priest, the high priest and the priest should have no defects uh, in them. Uh, and maybe under normal circumstances, because his eyes were dim and he couldn't see, uh, he ought to have stepped down. Uh, Leviticus 21 verse 18, it says this, and for whatever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose or anything superfluous and so on and so forth. Well, he is now, uh, he can't see. How does he, how does he even do his work? Maybe that's why Samuel was so busy uh, because the priest couldn't see. And, and um, but just the, the simple point, and I think it's important to see, is this, this man, uh, his blindness was both physical, but there's a spiritual dimension to it too. And again, we're encouraged in the word of God, the church at Laodicea, one of the problems was, with them is that they were blind. They couldn't see it like it really was. It was a, it was a, a spiritual condition. And uh, Second Peter talks about people who are blind and can't see afar off. And we need to say, Lord, do I have good hear ears to hear what you're saying to me? And do I have good eyes that I can see things as they really are? It, open my eyes that I might see. Uh, and uh, again, this man, his eyes had become dim. And then it tells us, verse 3, just again, painting this bleak scene, ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. And so this, this lamp uh, from the book of Exodus uh, just turn there, please, Exodus 27, uh, the lampstand uh, that was in, in the tabernacle, Exodus 27 and verse 20 and 21, we realize that it was to be uh, lit and to be burning during the night hours. It says, verse 20, it says, thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring uh, the pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always in the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. And so from evening to morning. And so the, the idea is that the lamp was still flickering but it's, it's almost dawn, right? It's almost about to go out, right? Here the lamp of the Lord went out. So it's almost dawn. And I think that's a, a spiritual picture as well. This darkness is about to give way to the dawn. And the dawn is God calling Samuel, right? So it's just, uh, but you know, they say the darkest hour is just before the dawn. And so here we've got the darkest hour, but the dawn is about to break. And so again, as we go back to this, uh, Verse three, there the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Do you know that this is the first time the ark of God is mentioned for 200 years, at least, depending on which chronology you look at. One I looked at said it was 275 years. Last time the ark is mentioned uh, is Israel's civil war over Benjamin. Remember when uh, the concubine and uh, Judges chapter 20. And uh, they consulted the ark because should they go up and fight Benjamin? And it's not mentioned from there, Judges 20, which actually Judges is not in strict chronological order in terms of time. And so that goes all the way back, actually 200, maybe 275 years. And the ark was not mentioned. And uh, that terrible, so, so the ark is mentioned in a bleak time, and then it's not mentioned. Again, there's this silence. 200 years passes by, and now the ark is mentioned again. And again, it seems that just indicative that God is about to work on behalf of his people again. So we have the call of Samuel. And we begin by stressing that it was an individual call. 
God called him individually to the prophetic office. And so it says the Lord called Samuel. Isn't it wonderful that God's now breaking the silence? No vision, uh, no word from heaven. Uh, heavens are at brass. Uh, things are dark. But out of the darkness, God calls. And he calls this man, Samuel, or this young man, uh, youth. And it says it was very personal. Called him by name, Samuel. And, of course, he answers, here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And so he didn't yet know the Lord, as we realize that from verse 7. He wasn't used to his voice. And uh, he hadn't previously received any direct personal revelation from God. And so uh, he, he um, mistook uh, this as the voice of Eli. Uh, he wasn't tuned to God's frequency yet, and uh, so he didn't recognize his voice. And, and so, verse 6, we notice the persistence of the call. And isn't it good of God? This is a manifestation of the grace of God that he didn't give up immediately and say, well, look at this, oh, hopeless youth. You don't even recognize my voice. I'll go somewhere else. No, he calls again. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. Samuel rose, went to Eli, said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. And then it tells us this statement. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. So this is a very interesting uh, thought here. Now, it's not the same. that We've seen this did not know the Lord once before. And it's in chapter 2, verse 12, when it talks about the sons of Eli. Uh, verse 212, now the sons of Eli were sons of Bel Belial, worthless sons. They knew not the Lord. But this is not quite, quite the same. Uh, in one sense, it is the same. They didn't, he didn't know the Lord. They didn't know the Lord either. Uh, but they didn't know the Lord, but they were willful and rebellious and weren't open to hear from him either. Uh, because even when they're confronted, they're unrepentant. He didn't know the Lord, uh, Samuel, yet. And in two aspects, I want to suggest. First of all, uh, he wasn't, as we said, used to hearing the voice of God speaking. But I want to suggest to you, too, that he, he'd, go, he'd grown up in the presence of the Lord, learned to serve in his tabernacle, yet he did not yet have a personal experience with the Lord. Now, this is very important. Because we've already learned about he had a godly mother. And this godly mother was a woman of prayer. And she prayed for her son. That She prayed she'd have a son. And I'm sure uh, there was much prayer uh, in the absence when he was in Eli's house. And she was back uh, uh, in the hill country of Ephraim. That she was praying earnestly for her boy Samuel. And she came once a year. But let's just say this, a godly mother can pray and even give a coat and every provision for a child, but she can give a child a personal relationship with God. That is something that they have to enter into individually. Uh, oh, we wish we could give every child of a believer. Don't we wish that we could give every one of them faith believing faith in the living god and if so every christian's ch child would be on fire believer for the lord we can't do that it has to be it's between them and god it has to be personal uh, being around the house of god cannot give it either so on the one hand he's got a godly mother and a godly upbringing and now he spent the last number of years around the house of god handling divine things that can't give life either. Uh, every person must experience personally an encounter with God. They must have do business with God. And this is Samuel's moment where he comes to not only know the Lord, but to recognize and hear his voice personally. And so it says in verse 8, the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And again, I just want to say this how gracious God is, how persistent God is, how he doesn't quit easily, right? Three times. 
And this is this third time he's going to make the same mistake. It says, the Lord called Samuel again the third time. He arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. By the way, you got to applaud the lad. He, he, he certainly uh, was, uh, was eager and willing and responsive, even in the middle of the night. Right? That's a, uh, that's a time when we're perhaps less eager and responsive. We're kind of semi-comatose, and it's very easy just to turn over. But he, was, he, was, he heard the voice. And he thought it was, still thinks it's Eli. He goes and he says, uh, here am I, for thou didst call me. And then it tells us that Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. And so let's uh, just kind of say something uh, in favor of, of Eli. On the one hand, uh, this is a very staggering statement in a sense that uh, you just imagine this dawning on Eli's mind. He's the high priest. He's the one who's ought to be receiving, if anybody ought to be receiving revelations from God, it's the high priest. And God is now showing, I'm bypassing you, and I'm actually going to this little lad. Now, there's different ways you could respond to that. One is you could become very bitter and uh, maybe even envious that God is speaking to this boy and he's not speaking to me. And yet Eli, not only does he perceive the Lord had called the child, Eli said to Samuel, he begins to advise him and help him. Go lie down and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went down and laid in his place. And so, we could say in favor of, of Eli. We said a lot of hard things about Eli, but there are some redeeming features. He does encourage, encourage the lad to respond if the call came again. It even gives him instruction what to say. And I wonder, I just wonder, now this is just on my part, maybe a little bit of speculation, but I wonder if Eli, due to the failure with his own sons, sought to invest in Samuel in order to seek to redeem himself from past failure. Because uh, I believe that he did have an impact on the life of Samuel in two ways, both as a poor example from his past, right? That's, we learn everybody, we can learn from everybody, right? Uh, when Lord wants to teach us what a shepherd is, what does he do? In Ezekiel 34, he tells us what a shepherd isn't, <laughs> right? Often he uses bad example to show us what a good example is. And so Eli was instructive in his failure. But also, I believe he sought to instruct uh, Samuel in a positive way, because you think about how well this boy turns out away from the influence of his mother from the time he was weaned in this godless environment, in a sense, where you've got Hophni and Phinehas, and really the only other, he's not hearing the voice of God until this point, All he, the only real instruction he's getting is from Eli. And I, I just wonder if, if this is Eli seeking to redeem himself for past failures. And it's interesting. Um, if we're honest, we can really help people, even through our failures, if we're willing to be vulnerable and be honest. We had a great uh, assembly prayer meeting on Wednesday night uh, on the First Timothy 2. We're talking about prayer, and uh, there was a couple of young men in our assembly who are really uh, very enthusiastic, keen young men. And it was just a joy to be able to tell them that that I wish that I had learned the lessons we were discussing about the importance of prayer 30 years ago. And I wonder how different my ministry would have been if I had learned the value of time in the closet 30 years. And I was trying to encourage the, these young men have a real heart for the Lord, encourage them through my failure. Don't wait till 30 years down the pike to become a man of prayer. 
you start right now. And, and I think it's good. We, if we just, we just got to, it takes vulnerability and it takes honesty, but I think we can really help people by our own failures and say, look, this is what I did wrong. And sometimes even somebody who's failed in marriage can actually be very instructive and say, I should have done this and I didn't, if they're honest, but it takes honesty, right? And, and that's the hardest thing because we want to present an image always that we're Mr. Perfect. And everybody knows we're not. So why, why play the game? Let's just get real. And I think that one of the great things that we lack sometimes in, I remember preaching at a place and I just shared some of my struggles and a lady came up to me. She'd grown up in an exclusive background and she was just weeping. And she said, Mike, she said, all the years that I was in exclusivism, we thought the men on the platform were, were almost like Catholic saints because they never admitted any vulnerability or any failure. And, and they always gave this impression they were perfect. And she said, I just felt so worthless because these <laughs> here are these people that are just up on this pedestal. And she said, this today is the first time I've actually heard anybody preach, which again, what an indictment. He was actually vulnerable about their own struggles. And he said, she said, this has brought great joy to my heart. Lord deliver us from pretending we're more spiritual than we really are, or that we're on this super, super spiritual plane, which, which is, and then if we do fall, what a blow that would be to everybody, right? Because they've got this idea that we're uh, Mr. Perfect, when it's very obvious we're not. So Lord, help us to be vulnerable and honest. Now notice, uh, again, as we go back to the text, uh, so he tells him, go, go lay down again. And when he, when he calls, say, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And notice verse 10, it says, the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Now, I want you just to notice this. This is, by the way, I learned a new word this week. Uh, it's the word appellative. We should never tire of using, I've got a dictionary on my, my phone, and I love to look up words that are new to me. And of course, I was thinking back to my French class, uh, je m'appelle Michel. So appellative, je m'appelle, right? So it's, 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 a, it's using a name twice, right? That's the idea, You're naming somebody twice. Now, it, I read in one commentary, that it, it's such a rare thing for God to address somebody twice. In fact, it only is used 10 times in the Bible. And typical of Bible commentators, he made that statement and didn't tell who the 10 were. Well, that drove me crazy. So I spent a good part of yesterday uh, trying to think and search and find out. So I found nine. So maybe you can help me with number 10 sometime. But you got, uh, for instance... Abraham, Abraham, Genesis 22, 11, when he's about to sacrifice his son. Uh, you got Moses, Moses, Exodus 3, 4, when he sees the burning bush. Uh, Jacob, chapter 46, verse 2, twice he speaks to Jacob. And then uh, Samuel, Samuel. And then when we get to the New Testament, uh, Saul, Saul, why persecute? Three times he does that, Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. Martha, Martha, Luke 10, 41. You're cumbered about with many things. Simon, Simon. That's in the context, Luke 22, 31. Satan hath desired to sift you like wheat. So I, I'm going to leave you with a task. <laughs> it's probably going to drive you as crazy as it did me. Find the 10th double appellation. But the idea, whenever it's used, it's God has got something he, important he wants to communicate. Uh, and, and he really wants to say something. Samuel, Samuel. So Samuel answers. And I want you to notice how he answers. It's not exactly how Eli told him to answer. What did Eli say? Eli said, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. He says, speak, for thy servant heareth. Interesting. He misses out, Lord. Now, again, I don't think for one minute that it was anything to do with a lack of respect or reverence on the part of Samuel. But I want to suggest to you that something different is occurring here. 
that was not in the previous callings. I want you to notice again, verse 10, in the first part of it, the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. Not only is the Lord speaking to Samuel this time, the Lord is standing next to Samuel and speaking to him. So this is a Christophany, right? Because we often use the term theophany, which is an Old Testament manifestation of the divine persons. And, uh, but I believe actually every theophany is really a Christophany because the Father is always revealed by the Son. And so Christ is the one who's the revealer of the, no one has got, seen God at any time. The only begotten who's in the bosom of the Father, he and he alone hath declared him. So son is the de declarer. So I know that technically it's a theophany, but I I'd like to say and prefer to say it's a Christophany because Christ is the one who always manifests God. And so I want, when usually when people are in the presence of God, Sometimes hard for them to get any words out. <laughs> Never mind, remember their rehearsed speech. Oftentimes they fall on the ground like dead men, right? So, so I want to suggest to you that it's no lack of reverence on the part of Samuel, but maybe just a sense of fear. He's in the presence of the divine. And so he, he, he knows what he's being instructed. And he said, speak for your servant heareth. I want to just uh, give a practical application because we always want God's word to be practical. But I want to suggest to you that when you read your Bible, a very good way to pray before you go to the text of Scripture is using these words. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. In other words, God is going to speak today and he's going to speak to us through his word. All right. And we want to hear his voice. And so when we say speak, we're, we're saying, Lord, I desire to hear your voice. When we say speak, Lord, we're saying, I recognize your authority that whatever you say, I've got to take it very seriously, right? Because of who you are. Speak. I want to hear your voice. Speak, Lord. I recognize your authority. And then your servant hears, the word implies hearing with interest and attentively. I want to do your will. Okay. And I think if, if those three things are present and, and, and genuine, I want to hear your voice. I want to acknowledge your authority. So whatever you say, I'm going to do it. And I desire to do your will. I believe God will speak. In one poet, put it this way, and I'll, and I'll just read it. It's just delightful. Oh, give me Samuel's ear, the open ear, O oh Lord, alive and quick to hear each whisper of thy word. Like him to answer at thy call and to obey thee first of all. Let me repeat that if somebody was trying to take it down. Oh, give me Samuel's ear, the open ear, O oh Lord, alive and quick to hear each whisper of thy word. Like him to answer at thy call and to obey thee first of all. Oh, that the people of God were more ready to hear and recognize his authority and obey his word. And maybe we should be praying about our ministry meetings as well. Lord, that the people of God would genuinely be saying, speak, Lord, your servant hears. And wanting to hear from God. Now, once God got Samuel's ear, he got it. Look at 1 Samuel 9, verses 15 and 16. This is delightful. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I'll send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, 
and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may see, save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me. But isn't that delightful? It says the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came. And so he's got the attention of this man. So what is he going to say? Now, this is Samuel learning to appreciate the holiness of God. And it says, the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'll do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. So something's going to be quite dramatic. Uh, this is this phrase, their ears will tingle. It's only used two other times in the Old Testament. Let's look at them. Both of them are connected with uh, severity of judgment and national disaster. Second Kings chapter 21 and verse 12. 2 Kings 21, verse 12. And of course, um, this is to do with the wicked King Manasseh of Judah. And it says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever heareth, it, heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And he's speaking about the Babylonian invasion and destruction of Jerusalem and the taking of the children of Israel into captivity. Uh, this is the evil he's going to bring upon Jerusalem. Jeremiah the prophet. Chapter 19. And we get this phrase used once more. About their tingling ears. 19 verse 3. And say, hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring evil upon this place. The which whosoever heareth, his ears shall tingle. So what is going to happen against Eli? Not only is it going to be the judgment of his house, but I want to suggest to you, it's going to be the capture of the ark of the covenant and the taking the ark from Israel. That, that is going to make everybody's ears tingle across the land. Something that was a national disaster. What a national disaster. The very symbol of the presence of God going into captivity. And so uh, Eli's house, uh, I have sworn to the house of Eli. Uh, notice the certainty of it. I've sworn to the house of Eli. Of course, he's referring to the message of the prophet that had come. Uh, now God is confirming his message in the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? The, the, the man of God came and spoke, and now it's being given again by God to Samuel and then shortly to be delivered to Eli. And it's certainty God is going to do this. And so he says, I've sworn to the house of Eli, that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Now, this is very, very serious. Uh, and um, I've skipped some verses. Verse, sorry, I jumped there. Look at verse 12. In that day, I'll perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. I will perform it. When I begin, I also make an end. So I'm going to, what I start, I'm going to finish. I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And so he's telling Eli, in a sense, oh, it's the message going to be given to Eli, that he had failed both as high priest and as head of his family. And how did he fail? He stayed silent in the face of evil. He failed to restrain his sons. His inactivity in restraining his sons was the cause of this judgment. Romans 2.2 says the judgment of God is according to truth. God is going to bring about this judgment. And again, it's important for us not to stay silent in the face of evil. And then verse 14, he says, uh, there's going to be 
uh, his sin will not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Now, that's a very imp- interesting phrase. And I'd like us to go to the book of Numbers just to understand this, that uh, this sin is not going to be purged. Numbers 15, verses 30 and 31. It says, but the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he hath despised the word of the Lord, and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off, his iniquity shall be upon him. And the idea was, as we talked last time, it's gone beyond the point of no return. No sacrifice is going to work. Judgment is certain. And he and his household will be taken away from his people. And so divine judgment would fall. And it was too late. No remedy could be found. And uh, so this is the message that is given Uh, to Samuel. And notice it says in verse 15, and Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Now I just got to stop there for a second because got some interesting things here. Was, was the tabernacle now more of a permanent structure? There's doors in the house of the Lord. Not only that, uh, remember he had a seat by the posts uh, of the house of the Lord. Eli did, in their sleeping uh, by uh, where Samuel, where the ark of God was. Ere the lamp of God went out where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. There were sleeping quarters in the court of the house of the Lord. So maybe that the, it become a little bit more of a permanent structure in Shiloh. Uh, it's not by any means Solomon's temple or anything like that, but, uh, but maybe there. Uh, they put some more permanent fixtures there. Uh, it's interesting. It's called the temple in this chapter. And so uh, he's serving God. Uh, it says, therefore, I, I sworn to the house of Eli, verse 15, Samuel lay until the morning, opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. And so he's keeping himself busy, but he doesn't really want to talk about what he's seen. And I can understand this. Um, First of all, he respected his elders, and to bring this message uh, to somebody who's an elder would be very difficult. And yet, uh, notice it says, verse 15, Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, here am I. And he said, what is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And so Samuel in these verses is learning to communicate God's message. Even when it's a difficult message to deliver. This is a test, right? Uh, To pass on this message. I often think of Daniel. It's easy for Daniel to tell Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the head of gold. Much more difficult to tell him you're the tree that's going to get cut down and you're going to eat grass uh, for seven years, right? So what we could say is that some messages, especially messages of judgment and confrontation, are much harder to give. And there's a reluctance here. But the true prophet of God must give God's message, whether it's welcome or not. We have to learn to preach the word in season or out of season, whether it's convenient, whether it's not convenient, right? We've got to give God's message as God gives it to us. And there's some messages that I've given, and I would much rather have talked about other things, right? With no pleasure in giving a hard message of confrontation to an assembly of Christians uh, much rather talk about something really edifying or whatever, uh, you know, that they'd like to hear. But sometimes we've got to give God's message. And especially if God has shown us something in the word of God, we must deliver it. And so he has to deliver this message. And uh, we have to, we have to, Paul says in, in uh, Acts 20, 27, 
I have not shunned to declare unto thee the whole counsel of God. And we, brothers, any of us that have responsibility to minister the word of God, and that's why I love, by the way, verse by verse, ex, uh, uh, expository consecutive teaching. Because nobody can say it. I remember one time I was preaching on a topic and I was going through the book and a guy was incensed. He said, who told you about me? I mean, he was really mad at me. And I said, if you'd have been here last week, I preached the previous chapter. This week I'm preaching this chapter. Uh, this has got nothing to do with you. This is just going through the Bible verse by verse. And it, it actually relieves you of a lot of responsibility when you do that, because you're just saying what God says and you can't dodge anything. You've got to give every passage whether they're easy to accept or not to accept. And so he says, um, in answering this, Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And notice Eli's response. And again, I'm just saying, I want to give some credibility to Eli. He said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth good. He, he's resigned at this moment to the will of God, even though it meant disaster to him and his family. It's like the statement, let God be true and every man a liar, right? It's a great statement. And so we, we have to, again, give credit to Eli here. And so um, our last three verses, Samuel learns to trust the word of God. It says, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. He did not let he did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, Dan being the northernmost part of the land, Beersheba the southernmost part of the land, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. The Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So everybody understands clearly Samuel is a prophet. And how did they understand that? Because he didn't allow any of his words fall to the ground. What that means is, whatever God revealed to him, it came true. And how do we, uh, we know that? It, God is establishing the man's credibility as a prophet. Look at Deuteronomy, just for a second. And with this, we'll close. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 21 and 22. If thou say... In thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, and thou shalt not be afraid of him. And so one of the evidences that a man was really a prophet of God is that what he said really came true. I'm wondering because... If you look at YouTube at all these days, there's a lot of prophets out there that are having uh, great specific prophecies. Uh, the rapture was supposed to have come during the Feast of Trumpets this year. Uh, those men should, be, Old Testament context, should be stoned to death because they, they gave a pronouncement on behalf of God that did not come true. And there are tons of them. They're having dreams and God is going to do this and God is going to do that. And uh, if we apply God's judgment on that, <laughs> they're all going to be dead men. And uh, But Samuel, not, none of his words fell to the ground. Everybody from Dan to Beersheba understood it, acknowledged that he was a prophet of God. And he trusted God's word. When God says something, he trusted it because he knew that what God said was true and would come true. And notice verse 1 of chapter 4, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. And so here we have a beginning of a new era. The darkness is past. The light has dawned. And God is once again speaking to his people. And we would say to us, you've already spoken. There's no doubt about it in the scriptures, in your son. But our question is, are we really listening? We would say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Amen.